All right, today we learn about radiometric dating. We will be determining the absolute age of a rock. So radiometric dating, this is what provides a numerical age or a date of a rock in a mineral that contains radioactive isotopes, such as uranium-238 and potassium-40, which spontaneously break down or decay to form stable isotopes. For example, the radioactive potassium-40, the parent isotope, decays to a formal st stable form of argon-40, and this is called a daughter isotope. So you need to make sure you understand that the parent is what is the radioactive material and the daughter is what is the stable form. So the decay rate is often described in terms of a half-life, which is the amount of time required for half the atoms of any starting mass of radioactive isotope to decay into a stable end product. This is called your daughter. After one half-life, half of the parent atoms are changed into equal number of daughter atoms. After the second half-life, half of the remaining radioactive isotope would still exist. So with each successive half-life, the remaining parent isotope would be reduced by half. So check out the table below. So to begin this, if we're at zero half-lives, we are saying that we have 100% of radioactive parent isotope. And therefore, if you have 100% of a sample, you have 0% of stable daughter. And this is a ratio of zero daughter to one parent. However, after one half-life. After one half-life, you have 50% or half of the total parent radioactive isotope that has decayed. So I have 50% radioactive still, yet I have 50% that is stable. So half of the, pro the, the sample is stable, half of it is radioactive. And this is a one-to-one -one ratio. Very important that we pay attention to the ratios because these are the ratios that we're going to be using to, to further make sense of this when we start talking about time. So if it goes through two half-lives, half of 50% or 25% of the sample is still going to be radioactive, whereas 75% or three-fourths of the original 100% is going to be stable. So I, now I have a 25% to 75%, which is a, right, a three daughter to one parent ratio. And if it goes through yet another half-life, through the third half-life, the ratio would be one half of 25%. So it would be 12.5% to 87.5%, or essentially it would be seven parts daughter to one part parent. So this is the process that we're going to be learning. So this is called radiometric dating. And here's what it looks like on a graph. Essentially, if I have 100 atoms of parent isotope, these are all going to decay. And as it, as it goes through one half-life, it's going to have 50 atoms of parent and 50 atoms of daughter product. In other words, half is going to be unstable, right? Unstable parent. Half of it is going to be stable daughter. And if it goes through yet another second half-life. So notice my x-axis here. These are my number of half-lives. Where my y-axis here is the percentage or the, the total number of radioactive element. So as I'm losing parent, I'm gaining daughter. And we'll look at this graph here in just a moment. So through one half-life, I have a 50-50 ratio, or one-to-one -one ratio. Through two half-lives, I have three daughter products to one parent. So it's a three-to-one ratio. 75 to 25 is a three-to-one ratio. And after three half-lives, I have seven parts daughter, one part uh, parent, or radioactive, or unstable. So let's take a look at this and let's apply this to our flipping pennies activity. We flip pennies and use the head side of the penny as the radioactive parent isotope. So the tail side we call stable daughter product. So after one flip or one half-life, roughly 50% of the pennies were heads and 50% were tails. Now if we do this like a couple times or a trillion times, you would find that the numbers, well let's just say it only has a 50-50 chance of being heads or 50-50 chance of being tails. So half the time it's going to be heads and half the time it's going to be tails. I mean really chances are very prescribed. It's 50-50. So this is analogous to having right the one-to-one the -one ratio, the 50 pennies for um, 50 heads and 50 tails is the same as having 50% of the isotope that's unstable and 50% that is stable. So we're looking at the ratio. The ratio of one to one tells us that it has gone through one half life. So after one flip, so now I can apply this graph here, where if I start off with 100 pennies and I flip them and I do this some number of times, you'll find that as I lose 50% of my 
unstable parent, I gain 50% of my stable daughter. So I always have, at this point right here, at one half-life, I always have 100 total sample. As I lose parent, I gain daughter. So here I have 50 parent and 50 daughter. Through a second half-life, notice, right, second half-life right here on my x-axis. Here I have 25% parent or unstable isotope, but I have 75 parts or three, four, 75% of the isotope is stable daughter. So notice, it's only the unstable parent that's decaying, and yet through a third isotope, I would have one-eighth of my total sample would be unstable parent, and I would have seven-eighths stable daughter. So I'm simply following these plotted points here. So if I were to call this blue, this is what I would call heads, and the red is what I would call the tails if I apply this to the penny activity. As I'm losing, right, as I flip the coins and I'm gaining tails, the tails are what we're calling tails are what we're calling stable, the heads are what we're reflipping. So the reflipping is simply the process of radioactive decay, or in this case radiometric dating. So how old so how do we know how old a rock is? Well we use radiometric dating techniques. Once a magma or lava solidifies, its radiometric clock begins. By knowing how to do this process, right, the scientific process, we can confidently come up with an absolute time. And this is nice because this allows us to start making inferences as to how old is the Earth, how old is our solar system. And we can actually date things using radiometric dating techniques. So these are some known radioactive parents that decay into known stable daughters in known half-life half years. So obviously potassium-40 decays into argon-40 in 1.25 billion years. This is a big number. So we would use this particular uh, ratio here when we're trying to figure out something that goes back into deep geologic time. But here's how this applies to minerals. Silicates contain radioactive minerals. Potassium-40, right, potassium feldspar, is very common in igneous rocks. Muscovite mica contains radioactive potassium-40. Uh, uranium can be found in both zircon and apatite, two different minerals here. So this last little video should help drive home the same concept of the very idea that we're looked at here. Nearly every textbook in science magazine teaches that the Earth is billions of years old, and the primary dating method used for determining this is what is called radioisotope dating, or radiometric dating. Now this is a reliable method for measuring absolute ages of rocks and the age of the Earth, right? Huh. First off, many scientists now regard the age of the Earth to be between 4.55 and 4.6 billion years old. Okay, so if this method is reliable and accurate, why the 50 million year discrepancy? That seems like a lot, but let's get into some details here and see what's going on. Keep in mind that there's all kinds of scientific jargon on this topic, and so we'll just present a very straightforward, simplified version of the process. Radiometric dating is the process of estimating the ages of rocks based on the decay of radioactive elements in them. Basically, there are certain kinds of atoms in nature that are unstable and spontaneously decay into other kinds of atoms. For instance, uranium will radioactively decay through a series of steps until it becomes the stable element called lead. The original element is called the parent element, and the end result is called the daughter element. Radioisotope dating is commonly used to date igneous rocks, rocks which formed when hot molten material cooled and solidified. The dating clock started when the rock cooled. During the molten state, it is assumed that the intense heat forced any gaseous daughter elements to escape. It is assumed that once the rock cooled, no more atoms escaped, and any daughter element now found in the rock is a result of radioactive decay since that rock formed. The decay rate is measured in terms of half-life. That is, the length of time it takes half of the remaining atoms of a radioactive parent element to decay. Now, of course, that can be measured in a laboratory, and it is assumed that since we know the decay rate, we can calculate backwards and come up with the age of the rock. But is that all there is to it? Here's where it gets tricky. It's true we can measure a decay rate using observational science, but there's another kind of science that is required to accurately calculate dates for rocks, and that is what we call historical science. Historical science deals with the things in the past, and therefore it cannot be repeated and tested. Dating methods require both types of science, because in order to get accurate rock dates, one would have to accurately know both the decay rate and the initial conditions of the rock sample, right? Since radioisotope dating uses both types of science, we can't directly measure the ages of rocks. There are assumptions involved. For instance, how do we know what the initial conditions were in the rock sample? How do we know the amounts of parent or daughter elements now in that sample haven't been altered by other processes in the past? How does someone know the decay rate has remained constant since the rock formed? The answer is, they don't. 
Let's simplify here and talk about a typical hourglass. Let's say you walk into a room and you see an hourglass with sand at the top and sand at the bottom and some sand sprinkling from the top chamber to the bottom. Well, observational science would allow us to see and measure the sand and then calculate how long the hourglass has been running, right? We could make our sand measurements and then calculate when the hourglass was turned over, right? Well, those calculations could be wrong because we may have failed to consider some major assumptions. Like, was there any sand at the bottom when the hourglass was turned over? Has any sand been added or taken out of the hourglass? Has the sand always been falling at a constant rate? Since we did not observe the initial conditions when the hourglass started, and we haven't been watching the sand all the time since then, we must make assumptions. All three of those assumptions can affect our time calculations. Now, of course, there's more to understanding all of this, but enough said.